<laughs> Jason, can you see the, the Zoom chat, the chat on the right side of the screen there? No, I can't. Let me see. I can probably pull it up though. Uh, Nishar actually had a funny comment that you're, you're the first person that's actually standing. Everyone, when we do these Zoom calls for all of these events, they always sit. So it's kind of neat that you're actually standing. I am trying to recreate a keynote presentation as well as I can um, as, as we do these while we're, while we're stuck to this remote world. So that I get, I get going too, and I can't get going right if I'm sitting down. So <laughs> I move around. Well, Speaking of get, getting going, we don't have you all day and uh, everyone's busy, so why don't we kick this off? Uh, my name is Mark Fish. I work at Lane Office. I'm the co-chair of the Young Leader Committee, and I've been talking to Jason uh, for a while about getting this event going. Uh, unfortunately, it can't be in person, but this is the next best thing with everything that we have going on today, obviously. Um, so I want to, you know, obviously thank Jason for his service uh, while he was in the U.S. Navy SEALs. I'm sure he'll explain a little bit more, but I know he has a little bit of a baseball background, which is partially how, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you sort of got into the SEALs. And um, he's going to be talking about the team mentality, leadership, and then thriving during adversity, which is quite applicable to now with COVID, among other things going on. Uh, throughout the, <clears throat> the presentation, feel free to ask questions if you can, but only in the, uh, the group chat, and then we'll answer them uh, on a first come first serve basis and then if you don't mind just please mute your audio and visual it seems like most people have done that so that uh, there isn't any background noise and without further ado jason i'll let you take it from here all right thank you very much mark and i appreciate everyone investing some time in me today i'm the, all, what this is all about the intent of it as i said i normally was hesitant to share my background but as I did, I started recognizing the value it had for others when I started sharing the lessons that I learned and then translating it to the environment they operated in, they started succeeding. Some of my buddies made it to the big leagues where I failed and some of my friends were working their way up the corporate ladder. And so I just started sharing uh, with them what I learned about high pressure performance, about leadership, about the performance value in a team first mind. So as I share these, this is what it's all about is increasing our performance through the fundamental principles of mindset and team culture, which is what I think we were really good at in the SEAL teams. But I had other experiences well before that, and let's start with baseball. All the way back to when I was 12 years old, I was a pretty good baseball player. I was on an all-star team, and I was playing against the next city over, and I hated these kids because they beat us every year, and they were really good. In fact, one year they went on to the Little League World Series, so to just beat them one time, would have been a huge accomplishment for me in my young life. And I went out, I was pitching, I went out on the mound and I quickly struck out the first two batters. Then I walked the bases loaded and I walked in two runs. But I was throwing pitches that were over the plate that I felt were strikes. But the umpire was the father of one of the opposing players. And that rivalry was real and it apparently seeped into adults as well. So my father calls time out. He's our coach. He's in the other dugout to come visit me on the mound. I start walking off the mound. I'm holding up the ball with my head down. I'm trying desperately not to cry, but I am. I'm crying. And as my dad walks out, I'm thinking maybe he'll yell at this guy, you know, uh, file a protest or defend me in some manner, but he doesn't. He twists my shirt and carries me back to the mound sets me back down on top of it, and he taught me a lesson that I think saved my life, both literally and figuratively later. He said, you're the best pitcher on this team, and everybody in the ballpark knows what's going on right now, but you can't control that, and neither do I. And if I put in somebody else, then they're just going to have to deal with what's happening. So do you want to go into the dugout and cry, or do you want to pitch? I thought, wow, you know, and I managed to kind of look up at him. I said, I want to pitch. He said, good then stop crying and figure out a way to get people out. All right, and what I decided to do there was go ahead and get back on the mound and continue to throw pitches that were over the plate. And by doing so, what I decided was, regardless of what's happening around me, I'm gonna do the right thing anyways. Now, I didn't win, the, win that game, but I did win the day because I learned a lesson that even though I had to go through a little bit of pain and a little bit of suffering in that moment, that gives us opportunity to build character. Right now, I could go in the dugout and cry, and it's completely justified. The circumstances, what was happening to me was unjust. It was wrong, and I could go in there, and I could cry, and I could quit, and I could complain, and I could blame and tell everyone about it forever. 
right? But that doesn't have any value. It doesn't help me grow and it doesn't help me win. So I have to embrace my unique set of circumstances, the adversities that are in my life and play the hero. And that's what my dad taught me to do at a very young age. So I engaged right there and I grew and I got better. And because I grew in character, I then became capable of accomplishing more. So I move on into high school. My father was a good mentor. They probably lock him up for these things now, but I was having a hard time with a, with a group of guys that were a couple of years older than me. And I had walked away from this fight a few times, didn't want to engage with this. And then one day, a bunch of them were waiting for me in a parking lot. And word had gotten to me that they were all going to try to beat me up at the same time and not make it a fair fight. So my dad happened to be with me. He said, what do you want to do? And he said, I said, I don't want to fight, but I think I have to. He says, yeah, I think you do too. And so he walked up there with me into that parking lot and he told all of the kids to go home. They said, no, in the 1990s teenager language said, no, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to hurt him, you know, either here or later somewhere else. So my dad said, all right. And he picked the main guy out and he said, you guys are going to fight one-on-one -on -one and no one else is going to jump in. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not going to break it up either. If you start to lose, I said, all right, but we didn't have that problem. And after the fight was over, my dad asked me, he said, how do you feel? I said, well, dad, I don't feel good. You know, it never feels good to, to harm someone. And to be honest with you, what I felt was free. I felt freedom from the fear that I had been living in. And what I realized was, although that I was scared, although I was scared, courage overcame that fear and courage creates freedom from fear. And that was a very valuable lesson for me, not just in that moment there, right? because I didn't have to win the fight. I just had to fight. And I knew the same, the same thing works in life. Okay. Is our dreams and our goals, our aspirations, the things that we really want to accomplish in life, they're going to follow us around whether we like it or not. And courage will create freedom from that fear, but we have to stop running away from it and we have to engage it. And that's what I learned to do. So I go on into high school and you know, another thing I learned about fear, I heard somebody say once, I forget the quote, but it says it's 100% dependent on us for its survival. That's not directly from me. And I started thinking about that. And the way we muster that courage up is by deciding that the freedom we want outweighs the pain that we have to take to get there. Because I certainly got hit in that fight. It wasn't one-sided, right? But the reward was incredibly worth it. So I took that lesson into my life and I ended up getting a college scholarship. Things were going very well for me in baseball to a division one school. And, and, I, and then a bunch of bad things happen. I won't break down the details of those for the sake of time, but I overcome a lot of adversity and find myself as a good pitcher on a top 25 nationally ranked baseball team in the NCAA. I was about six months away from the professional draft and had a very good shot at accomplishing that goal. And then I developed what's known as performance anxiety. As I would go to throw a baseball, my mind would register a threat, cause tension in my arm, and my hand would grip, and I couldn't control the baseball. In fact, I threw six wild pitches in a single inning, and that is an NCAA record that still stands from, I think, 2001, right? Almost 20 years now. I'm that guy. And that was the last competitive game of baseball that I ever played, and it almost broke me. It was an incredibly difficult time in my life. And I started to do things outside of my character because baseball, what I recognized completely defined me. I was dependent on it for my sense of self-worth, right? And through that dependency that created pressure, it created stress and it ultimately broke me down. And I made a mistake in that moment. I forgot the lesson of that little league lesson there for a moment. And I allowed myself to view the situation. I allowed myself to become a victim, right? And I was a victim of the circumstance, but so are we all. Not one single person in this entire earth has the exact same set of circumstances or adversities or experiences that they're gonna face. But when we allow that self-loathing to dictate our action through resentment, through anger, whatever else, it creates more victimhood. Victimhood mentality creates more victimhood. It is an absolutely worthless emotion in an effort to win. It's not immoral. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, it just has no value. 
in an effort to win. And what I did was, as I had taken this, I started making decisions that were not in accordance with my values and virtues. I became a bum, I became a drunk. And I remember one day I was laying in my hallway, face down, all my clothes on, couldn't remember the last three days, drool all over the floor. And I woke up and I thought, okay, man, this thing happened to you. Is it gonna determine who you're gonna be for the rest of your life? And I knew that I wanted to make a change. So, but I didn't know where to channel this. And that's why I was going everywhere else with it. So I just didn't know what to do. Like originally I channeled it back into baseball. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep going. I went and I took a bucket of balls and a good buddy and I threw baseballs for six hours straight. And so my arm could hardly move it anymore. And I was worse off at the end of the day than I was at the beginning. I was incredibly frustrated. I was angry. I didn't know what to do. And finally, once I had bounced off of all of the walls that weren't working, I went to God and I just said, help me. I don't know what to do with myself, but I'm broken. I'm embarrassed. I'm lost. And I felt these words come across my heart. It said, just wait, something better is coming for you. All right, call it what you will, but that's what I felt. And I had peace, overwhelming peace come across my soul. Now, I still didn't know exactly what was going to become of this, but I learned two lessons. One, victimhood creates more victimhood. Two, that baseball defined me. And I decided when I move forward from here that what I do will no longer define who I am. Who I am will define what I do. 9-11 happened that same year to watch the World Trade Centers come down on live television. I distinctly remember recognizing, hey, that wasn't an accident. Somebody intentionally attacked us. I became obsessed with military special operations. In accounting class, instead of bringing my homework, I was reading up on Army Rangers, Special Forces, you name it trying to figure out which direction I wanted to go. But I saw history unfolding before my eyes. I saw a great adventure that I could partake in, right? But again, I had to have the courage to engage and to do it. And I could not think with my position in life and the, the talents and, and abilities and skills that I've been blessed with of a more worthy cause for me to commit myself to. But I had to have the courage to try. And I learned a lot about confidence through that. And as I was watching videos and wanting to become a Navy SEAL, I was watching one and I saw a video and a guy was interviewed and they said, what is it that makes you guys so good? And he laughed and he said, oh, it's not that we're that good. It's that everybody else sucks. Well, I kind of laughed too, but I didn't really know why until later when I reflected upon my own career. And what that means to me is all those years as a young baseball player, and all the other things I did was my standard was based in comparison. My standard for performance and whatever it is I do, whether it's real estate, baseball, SEAL teams, you name it, sales, my standard for performance was based in comparison to the competition. I wanted to be a little bit better than everyone else to be best, okay? And it worked, we, were, we, were, we won our conference. I got a lot of playing time, all right? But when I got into the SEAL teams or special operations, that mentality was challenged and it was changed because we never really compared ourselves to anyone else. In terms of who was the best, it was not can we get a little bit better than the rest, it was how good can we get? Maximization of potential is what was demanded of us and what we were held accountable to. And maximizing potential individually and as a team was the standard that we were held accountable to. And the way, in my opinion, we were able to maximize potential is by relentlessly executing fundamentals under extreme stress. All right, fundamentals, controllable actions of value, meaning no matter what's going on around us, a, a, a malfunction with a parachute, so, you know, bullets coming at us, whatever it may be, we focus on what we can affect and work the problem. All right, that's what I call, I call that, eliminating the variables because you see we can't force results when we compete against each other if we were to compete against each other in something and we could force results then i would win and you would win every single time that's not how competition works that's nonsensical so we don't force results in competition we influence them and what we want to do then is influence them to the greatest degree possible and how we do that is by demanding perfection or at least a pursuit of perfection, 
of everything within our control. But here's the key. We got to understand those fundamentals, controllable actions of value, and what we're trying to perfect, what we're chasing after, where all of our focus and energy should be to influence to the greatest degree, exists not only in how we execute action or process, how I give a sales pitch, shoot my weapon, whatever it may be. All right. It's also in how we think and how we treat each other. And I can prove it, you know, because I could teach everyone listening right now how to jump, dive, and shoot. It's not all that difficult, but that doesn't make you a special operator. I've got to know you that you can respond properly and execute in adversity. I've got to know that you're going to be, you're going to have a team first mentality when things are at their worst rather than default to self-preservation because that's natural, that's what's normal, and that's what we have to fight against very often, is that natural inclination until our habits become something different, because our instructors taught us, they said, you won't rise to the occasion. When you get in combat, you're not going to rise to the occasion and perform better. You're going to default to your standard of training, and nothing was proven more true to me than that. And we knew that that day was coming. So what we do today in our preparation makes us who we are when it matters most. We want our habits to be fundamentally sound until they're without thought in how we do what we do, how we think, and how we treat each other every day. Mechanics, mindset, and culture. And when we pursue that relentlessly without moderation, they say moderation is for cowards is one of our one of our sayings to help remind us of that principle, because when we truly relentless with it, it creates respect and trust within each other. And that respect and that trust within each other manifests itself into a desire to fight for each other when everything's on the line. And that's what we want to create within our own organizations and in our own teams. But it starts today with that pursuit of best, because even though we can't force results, we can fight for them. We can fight for them relentlessly without moderation by attempting to create fundamentally sound habits. And now I'll get into what some of those habits are. And the first one is confidence. And it's important to understand confidence you don't have to have it. You can perform well and not be confident. You've done that before. You can be very confident and fail. You've done that before. But when we're confident, we'll create consistency. Confidence to me is certainty, and certainty is being loose, relaxed, and in the moment. And the more loose, relaxed, and in the moment, the more consistency we're going to have. And the more consistent performance we have, the more separation we create. We create enough separation, we become what's called elite because there's only a few. So loose, relaxed, and in the moment. How do we gain that? It comes from where we place our trust, right? And the problem we fight as, as the problem we battle against as human beings is we, we're naturally inclined to place our trust in two sources that we cannot control. And those two sources are critics and statistics, all right, or numbers. So what I mean by critics, what people think and say about us. You know, our minds, I believe our brains work like this. We are constantly receiving information from how people treat us. And through that information, we make a determination often of our own value and our status and the, and the social status. All right? And sometimes that can imprison our belief of what we feel like we can accomplish, of our own potential. And I've noticed that anything hard I've ever tried to do, those people will give you a thousand reasons why you can't do something. They'll sit around and they'll inspire, yourself, inspire themselves to do nothing because it helps justify their choice. All right? But winners find an excuse to win. They find one reason why they can. All right? I had faith that my life had intrinsic purpose and that I was born to accomplish some sort of greatness that I believe that about everyone. And you don't need anybody's permission to honor that, just the courage to try. And that courage will create freedom from the imprisonment of the critics. The second place is we often place our trust in the odds, right? Not necessarily, so statistics and numbers are a good thing, okay? But we place our numbers in the odds. 
if you look at the amount of men that, create, that quit my BUDS class, so to quit BUDS is SEAL training and to quit during Hell Week or any other part of it, you have to ring a bell three times and say, I quit. And 83% of my class did not make it through. There were some injuries, but a vast majority of people that go there and fail do so under their own choice. They decide to not continue with the training. They drop on request. There was nothing special about me, okay? We're not extraordinary people, they say. We're ordinary people who are trained to accomplish extraordinary things. And uh, when, when I look at that, so that's 83% of people who quit. So if you had told me that at the beginning of the class, I might not have ever even started, okay? But the way I overcame that is I knew that I could take the easy path. I could go get a job and do something comfortable. But I knew in my heart I was made for something more. I knew this was the direction. Everything was pushing. My passion was working like a compass saying, go this way. And if I denied that, I was denying the very essence of who I am. And easy paths equate to being comfortable, not receiving joy. They don't grow character. Hard equates to joy, and we grow character along the way as long as we respond properly. Like my father taught me on the little league field, and I, and, and I was taught to value time. You get one life, and you don't know how long you get. So why waste it being imprisoned by the odds? It's supposed to be hard. And why be imprisoned by other mortal people who are running out of time also? Right? We place our trust in critics and odds all too often. But what we can do to negate that, to have true certainty that is not dependent on external sources, is to place our trust in our preparation, in each other, and those we surround ourselves with, and our conviction and purpose. Trust and preparation. We were taught to have attention to detail, do things the right way or again until we cannot get them wrong, the controllable things. We were taught to give relentless effort I call that effort that currently feels unreasonable until it feels reasonable. I had to, we had to do two mile ocean swims in cold water. I was completing the swims, but failing the time. And if I failed another time, I would be removed from my class. And I remember thinking, man, you just got to swim harder. And I swam as fast as I could until I puked. And then I tried to swim faster and I passed the swim barely, but I passed. And I thought to myself, if I could do it once, I could do it again. And if I can do it again, I can do it as many times as I want. I just got to ask myself, is what I want worth it to me? Not do I want it. That doesn't separate me from anybody. Everybody wants to be successful. Everybody at that training wanted to graduate. Is what I want worth it to me to do what is necessary to create it? Okay. And for me in that moment, it was. And the reason why it's important is one of our instructors told us later, he said, you know, one day guys, he said, think about this. There's a man training to kill you. And one day you're going to meet that man. And when you do, you're going to know, you're going to be certain. You're going to be confident that you're better prepared for that moment than he is. And you're also going to have better men next to you with the team first mind, right? The people we surround ourselves with, we never, that's why we have hell week. Why do we have such a high attrition rate? because we never sacrifice character for talent. I saw our biggest, fastest, strongest guy cry and quit on Monday morning. And I was so happy to see him go because when things got hard, he blamed other people and he complained and he whined. He was the kid that probably cried in the dugout, okay? And even though we had all that talent and ability when things were easy, he provides us no value in a gunfight that I'm about to tell you about because Talent is worthless when it runs away and character is priceless when it's time to hold the line. So in our promotional and in our hiring systems, we've got to have something that evaluates character in addition to skill and have conviction and purpose. Short-term failures are necessary to create long-term success. For everything that I've accomplished, there's, there's a bunch of failures underneath each one of those. But again, character has grown through those. So you, you become more and you can accomplish more through them. You are forged, not broken through them, but you got to be willing to take the hits along the way so that you're a much better individual five years from now and a much stronger, better company five years from now by responding well to these hits as we go. And there's a lot of them out there right now, and I'm feeling it too. It's tough out there, but the moment will pass. And when it does, and we look back, are we going to be proud of who we were and what we did? And that's the question that we should ask ourselves 
because that's the beginning of mental toughness. So confidence. And then second fundamental I'm gonna talk about is mental toughness. To me, adversity has properties. It's when circumstances are unfair and uncontrollable. And the best way not to fear adversity is to understand the value it provides in our life. You see, adversity creates a struggle and struggle creates reward or opportunity for reward, dependent on how we respond. Do we engage or do we go cry, right? And adversity is real, it hurts, okay? But the thing to realize is that there is no reward without the struggle. And the greater the struggle, the greater the reward. And we have to realize it's supposed to be hard. Hard things, if you want to accomplish something hard, difficult, become very successful, it's supposed to be hard. Hard things meet heavy adversity by their very nature. Otherwise, they'd be easy and everyone would do it. And that's why our instructor said, embrace the suck. The suck is coming. Whether you run away and hide or not, the suck's going to come. Life's going to punch you whether you like it or not. So you might as well punch back and learn how to respond. And that's what I learned how to do. I remember running up and down this, this hill, up and down, up and down the sand hill. And this kid's like, my leg my leg. And the instructor swarmed him and they said, it's supposed to be hard. Where do you think you are right now? So when we engage in a battle and we, if we run away the first time we get hit, we have to realize we chose to be here. This is what we want and we have to earn it. And the way we earn it, the way we respond and be mentally tough, I don't want to say just be mentally tough. Here's how to do it. Our emotion is initially driven by the environment. Something bad happens that is unjust, unfair, uncontrollable. And it makes us feel bad. And a lot of people will live their entire lives acting according to how they feel. Mentally tough people stonewall it. That's the name of my company. They stonewall that emotion right there and they insert thought and action of value. Will my response have value or no value? And the way they do that is by shifting focus, environmentally driven, a bullet flies by. It's scary at first and then I shift my focus into two things. The execution of action process. What do I need to do to win? And the people around me. The majority of our anxiety comes out of self-concern. The more I'm focused on my teammates, the more that goes away, the more I'm loose, relaxed, focused, and engaging and winning the fight in front of me. And I learned this through the most dangerous situation I've ever found myself in. And it was, I wasn't in a lot of fights, not nearly as many as a lot of other other guys, but I was in one that went a little bit south and we were on a deployment. Right before the deployment, I had my little girl born and I spent three weeks with her and then I went overseas. That might have been harder than hell week was leaving her and we're now on the end of deployment and we're coming home. Or at least we were told we were coming home. But then we were told we had to go back out on one more operation and our mission was to kill or capture a really bad dude in a land far, far away and we get this information. I would normally have more people on my team, but for reasons undisclosed, it got cut down to myself and one other, uh, one other Navy SEAL and one of the local soldiers. Okay. And we would go in ahead, a little bit ahead of a larger force. So we're supposed to have gone home already. At least we thought get the team cut down and a few other things that probably met those properties of adversity. We take off through the city, get to where we're going, and as we're making our way in, we come under effective fire. People wake up, they start to engage us. No big deal, this isn't our first rodeo. We've ran our plays so many times, we can't get them wrong. I move into the contact to attempt to suppress it. My buddy moves behind me to get to a better point. It's my turn to move now as we're covering for each other, shooting, moving, and communicating, but the fire becomes effective. There are a few men on top of rooftops and there are a few things called tactical advantages. And we didn't really have any of them other than we were trained better than these guys. And as we're moving, my buddy says, hey man, stay down, stay down. I'm crawling on my belly, trying to get to him. A few rounds are snapping over my head, impacting the wall behind me. He goes, dude, do not get up, stay down and go back to where you were. As he's trying to shoot and cover fire for me, we just couldn't suppress it. So I start crawling backwards. I get to where I'm going. I think the enemy is probably going to try to flank us and come up this street that's offset and a little bit behind us. I dive through a pile of trash to conceal myself, poke my head off the other side of the street. 
thinking, Lord, please don't let anybody be in the street, but there are a few people making their way towards me. I engage them with warning shots, really stupid thing to do because once you shoot warning shots at people that want to kill you, they then know where they are and they engage you. So now we've got a contact front and a contact right. We're caught in a bit of a crossfire. And I remember in that moment, my teammate says, it comes over the radio. He says, Jason is pinned down and you guys need to get up here now. Calling back to our a larger force that could come help us. Now, I don't, I don't like to say that I was pinned down. I'll just say that I couldn't move left or right or up or down without help <laughs> and, uh, or a high, a high likelihood of getting hit. So I want to tell you what I thought about in that moment because time slowed down. And when it did, a few things crossed my mind. And the first thing was managing emotion. So I remember I did have a flash of my little girl in that Disney World trip. Quick flash. And what often that's called emotional attachment to the outcome. I want to live and I don't want to die. You want to succeed and not fail. All right. And that can oftentimes create pressure. I feel like I've got to force it. When I feel like I got to force something I can't control or I'm dependent on it for my self-worth, it creates pressure and stress. And that does not help us become loose, relaxed, and focused in the moment. Well, rather we harness it and we turn it into aggression. We allow it to fuel our fight. And I remember thinking that, and I remember taking it and thinking, no, if you're gonna take me out, you're gonna to have to earn it. You're gonna to have to defeat everything that I am and have been trained to do. I wanted to be here. I was mad when I didn't get to go to war. I had to go train other people and things. So this is your chance. What are you gonna do with it? it? Goes back to that kid again. Are you gonna go in the dugout and cry? Or are you gonna embrace this right now? And if you die out here, if you get ears, then so be it. But at least let your little girl know who her daddy was. Leave your legacy and wage war. And honestly, in life with legacy, that's what people are gonna remember about you. They're gonna forget numbers and certain successes, but they're going to remember who you were in critical moments. So you harness the emotion and you allow it to fuel your fight. And then you shift your focus off of what's happening and into the action, the execution of action or process. What do I need to do to win the fight in front of me? Fortunately, because our training was so well, the men who trained me saved my life the habits that we had were very strong. We went into right what we needed to into exactly what we needed to do. Shift focus into other people. I look over and I see my teammate and he's fighting and he's fighting hard and he's calling into the other guys. He's shouting at me. He could have left me. He could have ran down the street and left me, but I knew he wasn't going to. And that gave me a lot of certainty in the moment. I trusted him. And because of that trust, it manifested itself, like I said back in the beginning, into a desire to fight for each other. And then we went to work. Some of our teammates were able to get up there and throw some grenades and provide some cover fire for us. I was able to move and link back up with the other members of our larger force. And now we're gonna go through and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna assault this area that we had just been shot away from. And as we do so, I was going to go, I was going to go in the courtyard. I was going to go in the gate first because I had seen it and it made tactical sense for me to do that. But I was scared. Okay, we have fear. And I remember locking in, I got an infrared laser I can see with my night vision, locking into that, locking my focus into something small and a deep breath. And what I was doing there, it doesn't matter what happened two minutes ago. It's over with. All that matters is what I've learned from it. I'm letting go of it, releasing it, and I'm locking in to win the fight in front of me. Let go, lock in, win the fight in front of you every day, during moments of day, because I'm not the only one going in there. There's somebody else going through that gate with me, and it is selfish for me to be any other version than my best before we do. So we let go, we lock in, we win the fight in front of us, because this three and a half seconds in front of our face is all that matters. And we focus on each other. And the way I learned to do that is the value in the team first mind and I'm gonna finish with this principle. So we hit confidence, mental toughness. And I wanna talk about the value of a team first mind, the performance value, because a lot of times we think of it as a moral value and it is. I wanna be a service selfless type person because it's the correct thing to do. But if we ever thought about how it helps us perform better to achieve our individual goals, every day I believe we have a choice and we, we fluctuate along this spectrum okay, of status or service. 
status meaning I want to be a big deal and receive praise from others and versus, you know, the joy and accomplishment. And, and it's different from goal setting and, and wanting to accomplish things, prove people wrong. That's all okay. It's when my why, my purpose, my motivation, okay, that driving internal force is status driven. I want people to think I'm a big deal. It drives failure because I can't control what people think about me. And when I feel a need to force, that for, you know, for me to be a big deal, other people have to think I'm a big deal and I'm dependent upon that. And when I try to force that, something I can't control, it creates pressure and stress, the opposite of being loose, relaxed, and in the moment, which creates consistent performance, which creates eliteness, right? So the other side of that, selfless service to team and mission. Selflessness, you know, it means we, we give to the team, we serve the team without expectation of anything in return. But check this out. It doesn't mean you're not going to get anything in return. It just means we can't have the expectation attached. Otherwise, it's not truly selfless. Okay. And when we serve each other, it does two things that, that help our performance. It reduces anxiety to a minimal level and it creates the most effective form of motivation. And here's how, how does it reduce anxiety? If I get concerned before a combat operation, if I get concerned for my own life and death, it's for my own life and death. So that anxiety is like a parasite feeding on my own self-concern. And if I defer that concern to the well-being of teammate and, and, and accomplishing the mission, I've taken away the source, right? That anxiety has nothing to feed upon. It has nowhere to go. It's very difficult to do that at a, at, at a complete and pure level. But the more we can create that as our habit and part of our character, the more loose, relaxed, and in the moment we're going to be. And when we act in a selfless nature, we then create the emotions of trust, of love, respect, and we're operating out of those. All right. And um, the thing to recognize is the action comes before the emotion. You see, a lot of times we want to put family and brotherhood or whatever it is on our core values, on a sign in our office or on a shirt that we wear. And the thing is, they're just words unless we live them. But we think, man, so-and-so owes me something first before I do, right? We all get that way. So one day we've all just got to decide, hey, no, I'm going to live this way. And if we all decide to live this way, then we collectively as a team thrive and as individuals. And as we act that way, we create trust and love and respect. And it's the most powerful thing on earth. And I can prove it. If I were to give you guys an opportunity to fight me in Mortal Kombat or a fist fight, and you were, you, you probably, and you could tell everyone you were tougher and took down a Navy SEAL. Most people would, don't want to do that. But if you change it and you say, what if I had the person you love the most in this world behind me and you had to come through me to get to them or you would never see them again, probably everybody listening would fight me then. But the problem didn't change. It's still me and whatever you assume my ability to be. But the motivation changed. You won't fight in one, but you will in the other because you're fighting for something greater than yourself. And that feeling that you have is because that person you're thinking about and you met some sort of expectation, some sort of standard of expectation within that relationship that you have. So it's worth it to you. Okay. And to me, that's really what brotherhood is, is because they said, you know, I've heard that people say, well, special operations in the military, they're like the ultimate brotherhood. Well, I thought about that because there were guys I didn't like and still don't like and probably never will like, but I go to war with them because I trust them because they do what they say they're going to do. Brotherhood doesn't mean we agree all of the time. It means we set aside our differences to serve a greater cause. And if everybody in the world could get a hold of that concept, it'd be a lot better place. And that's the choice that everybody has to make on a team is we can either work against each other those teams fail quickly. Most teams, the status quo, work with each other. Elite teams work for each other with that desire produced through the standard each and every day and until it becomes innate in your character. So one thing they taught us to do was to say this phrase in our mind as we would patrol. And the phrase was, if I get shot at right now, what will I do to support my buddy? 
few different ways of saying it. That's how I remember it. If I get shot at right now, what will I do? What is the process? What is the action that I need to take? Okay. And then to support my buddy, keeping my mind off of myself and onto my teammate, the two places it needs to be as I patrol through a dangerous area, what will I do? What do I need to do to win the fight to support my buddy? And everyone is saying that in their heads over and over and over again. And it goes off and we go, right? Because and then it becomes innate in our character until we don't know how to be anything different. And I saw that come through in its most pure form with what I saw my teammate do in a helicopter crash. We were taking helicopters out to a ship on a training operation and we were roping onto the ship to take it down. And as if it had been hijacked. And our first helicopter came in that I was on and we came down on it. And as I turned the corner, I watched the second helicopter with my friends on it crash into the ship. I saw pieces fall into the ocean in a fireball. I ducked under cover just to protect myself from the pieces that were coming uh, at us. And then I made my way into the ship. Eventually we get to the crash site. When I got to the crash site, I saw a lot of men who were wounded and there was one who had been uh, killed, in, killed in action or killed in training. And one of those men who were wounded was my buddy who was in that fight with me. And he had shattered his hips in three places completely in half. We didn't know that at the time, okay? And he had managed to walk away from the helicopter somehow and collapse on his back. He was also our most experienced conscious medic at the time. And we said, how do we fix you? What do we do? And he started telling us how to help everyone else first. So we start providing them aid. And then when we're done and he felt comfortable with that, he said, I have internal bleeding. I think I've cut my femoral artery and I'm probably going to die within about 20 minutes if you don't get me to surgery. And we did. He's alive today. And we, and they, but when I think about that story, it's fascinating to me because I can still see him there very vividly doing that. And he knew his life was on a clock, a running clock. Yet he still took the time to go around and make sure that we knew what to do with everyone else first before he would allow us to take him off of that ship. And the thing to understand about it is that's not a decision that's made in the moment because you don't rise to the occasion, right? You default to your standard and his standard had been selfless until it had become innate in his character and he didn't know how to be, how to be anything different. And you may ask, what's the performance value in that? And it's a fair question. When you look at a man and you know that he would die for you without hesitation, and that's what I saw in his eyes. I hope I have that in me, but I saw it in his eyes and I know it without a doubt from him. You trust that man. And that trust is what gives you the courage to get back out there and win the fight in front of you. It's how winning is done and it pays to be a winner. And with that, I will turn the, uh, the mic back over and I would be happy to field any questions that anyone might have for me. If it's something I can't answer, I'll just simply tell you that, but feel free to ask whatever you'd like. And I appreciate your time. Thank you all very much. Jason, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few questions over on the side there. And if anyone thinks of any, feel free to add them to the group chat. But uh, the first one, uh, I'll just read it verbatim. It says, it seems like you define confidence as more of a practiced habit than a personality trait sort of like grit, uh, how do you build that? Yeah, it's probably a little bit of both. So I try to break these intangible feelings and thoughts into something that is process driven that we can create and will work in any high pressure environment to the best of my ability, but nothing's really that clean, you know, unless it's like math, okay? So I think that confidence can be gained through experience. The more success you experience, the more internal innate confidence that you have, I do believe that some of it is personality driven and things like that. That being said, whatever baseline of experience and internal personality you have, I think that you can create much more confidence. And I think a very unconfident person can eventually become a very confident person through these processes. Okay, awesome. Uh, we got another one. Uh, Jason, how do you motivate or influence your team members who might not be as focused or passionate or motivated as you? Uh, and then a little part two or add on to that is uh, especially, you know, right now because you're not able to build or maintain relationships in person as we had, you know, back in February and previously. Okay, let me, I don't want to get off track on that. So it's how do you motivate those who are less motivated? Yeah, basically. How do you motivate or influence your team members that might not be as focused or passionate as you? 
And then especially given the current uh, environment. Yeah, because you can't really see them in person or you're limited and most of the interaction is on Zoom or uh, FaceTime or phone calls. Yeah, so um, how to motivate the unmotivated? Well, it's a fair question because so one thing I skipped over in the team first mind, you know, when you talk about brotherhood and commitment to team, it's much easier when you're at war and you're in a combat unit because the cause we're serving at its most raw form is survivability. I don't want to die and neither does my teammate. So we're gonna, we've got an underlying force that creates a desire to set each other up for success. The better he is or she is, the better chance I have at surviving this thing. And that underlying force does not exist in the corporate world or the athletic world. In the athletic world, there is a little bit more of that passion because we're either trying to go pro or, you know, big league ball players, you know, they're living out a dream, whatever it may be. But, you know, anything becomes a grind after time. And then in the corporate world is where it's much uh, more difficult to create that because that intrinsic passion may be a little bit less. So you can always remind people of their why and visit that a little bit. Why are you here? Why do you do what we do? Um, starting with the right people, hiring people who have some sort of intrinsic passion about, you know, whatever industry it may be or role that uh, they are fulfilling and then people of high character traits. But given all that, and say so you're right here where you are right now, different things motivate different people. So I've noticed that empowerment can help motivate people. That being said, there's pieces in place. If you go straight to a very decentralized leadership and empowerment structure, it can wreak havoc. Ours and the SEAL teams is very decentralized, but there's processes in place that make it effective. And I've seen guys from our community try to implement that in other places and it, and it can be not great. So, but empowerment can help, does help people when they're empowered, they feel all right, a, a, an increased sense of responsibility and ownership in what's happening. Uh, transparency, being completely transparent with how and what decisions we're making and why. And, um, and then incentivizing. Incentivizing is difficult because people value different things. One person may want more time off. Another person may want more money. One person may want more opportunities to be promoted, whatever it may be. But I think the most powerful thing, honestly, regardless of all of those, is human connection. And in the current environment, that's what we're losing because all of our engagement is very serious business work. And where we connect with each other in an office space is not during the meeting, it's the five minutes before the meeting when we're talking about our kids' baseball and soccer games and gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about uh, whatever, current events and arguing with each other even or agreeing with each other, whatever it may be. But we're connecting and we're developing relationships on our break periods and our lunch breaks. And we're not doing that now. Um, so I think that becomes very difficult. So I think we need to be intentional about creating connection and developing relationships within our team and asking them, maybe not too personal, but having some of those personal conversations with each other. And I think that truly motivates people more than anything else. Okay, awesome, that sounds great. Um, sort of a related, oh, one. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Hey, the more, more the better. Uh, sort of a related question. Uh, what do you do to refocus teams that you work with uh, on that purpose and that pur purpose being in quotations. So particularly during these times when there's so many other things taking up the mental space and people are worrying about a lot of different things. Okay. Say the first part again. Now, uh, what do you do to refocus teams that you work with on that purpose? Purpose, you know, being in quotations. So emphasis on that. Yeah. Especially during COVID when there's a lot of uh, other things that people are worrying about. Okay. So as a leader, and if you go to uh, my LinkedIn profile or to the website, it's uh, stonewall-solutions.com. I wrote an article about mindset specific to COVID and it will, it will relate to this, but we have to honor that people's, not only their professional lives have been interrupted, but also their personal lives because kids are home. We're trying to work remotely, whatever it may be. And so somebody asked me, she asked me, she said, well, how do I, how do I be a great homeschool teacher and get my eight hours a day in at work and do this and do that? And I said, you don't, because you're trying to invent time and you can't invent more time. You don't find time, you prioritize, you prioritize time. So I said, instead of being time oriented and I'm going to get this many hours of this thing in, 
be more task oriented. What are three to four things you need to do today for business? And what are three to four things you can do to keep your kids on the right track or whatever it may be? And you can fine tune that, but you get the idea. So I made it more task oriented versus time oriented. And then you help shift their focus. One thing I really like to do with teams to create strong culture is what I call who, what, why. Who are we? And come up with three core values. Just three, because that's all we can focus on effectively. And then what? What is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish? And then why? Why do we want it? And then, you know, even in a brief Zoom meeting, you can say, hey, let's review our who, what, why. We are, you know, team enterprise, and this is what we're about, hard work, customer service, and, you know, being thankful, whatever. And then this is our mission, what we're going to accomplish this year, and here's why and where it's going to put us. And, uh, you know, just revisiting that often. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, we got another one here. A little personal. Your personal story is inspirational, given our current global situation, with many feeling that we are under an inter insurmountable and invis invisible enemy attack. What advice or guidance would you offer to anyone to find that personal empowerment that you found? Repeat it one more time, Mark. Sorry. But during this current global situation, you know, we feel that there's an insurmountable uh, task with COVID. It's essentially something that we haven't dealt with. Uh, what advice and guidance would you offer to anyone to find the personal empowerment and uh, I guess drive to succeed that you have found? Okay, so I would go back to the moment will pass and when it does, are we going to be proud of who we were and what we did in that moment, right? The hard part, I'm kind of thinking out loud right now, I don't have a real structured one for this one, um, is the uncertainty. So to just be completely honest with everyone, what I've always done with uncertainty is taking it straight to God and I've prayed, all right? And that has always produced for me over the course of my life. Maybe not right in that moment, but having that faith that I am either going to be forged through this difficulty and I'm going to value who I become in this life and the character through the hardships more than gaining comfortability or money or whatever. Okay. I've lost a lot when this hit, I can dwell on that all day long and think what if, or what we could have had or whatever was going to be one of the best year Stonewall solutions ever had, or I can just get my mind off of myself and realize other people are struggling too and do the best that I can to help them. And I battle this. I'm not perfect at it. I go back and forth too. I have my woe is me moments also. Okay. But I get back into faith. I, I honestly, be honest. I mean, if you guys want me to just be very raw and real, I try to stay off of social media as much as possible. I don't even really watch the news all that much. Okay. I try to take care. If I could take care of myself, right. And I can influence the others around me in my spectrum, then that's what I can do. Now, if you want to do all that and you can handle it and you need to be whatever, that's fine. I'm not knocking it or anything else. I'm just telling you what helps me. All right. And that's usually where I, with uncertainty, that's where I take it. I take it straight upstairs and I, and, I, and I believe and I have faith that this is going to work itself out. And even if it doesn't, and it works itself into something bad. I'm going to grow through it. I'm going to be fours until one day I meet my maker. All right. Incredible. I'm getting a lot of positive response here on the side. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to ask them, you know, uh, in the chat or just uh, turn off your mic and, Ask Jason uh, yourself. But we got a couple more minutes for some Q&A. Hi, Jason. My name is Mindy, and Mark already read out one of my questions. But I think that I know that you can't see all of the, the chat, but um, pretty much everyone who participated has said, one, thank you for your service to our country. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us, but um, really, and thank you to, to Mark and the whole uh, Young Leaders team for putting this together, because what you're talking about right now, the mental fortitude, for me, is so timely, because I get up, I, I put on my makeup, do my hair, even though I'm sitting at home all by myself, and I've got no one looking at me, but I do it because I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror when I walk by it, um, and I, I started getting a little bit what was me so your your points and your your the things that you spoke about today were so timely and on point and it gave me the the swift kick in the ass that i needed to kind of get re-motivated <laughs> so i wanted to say thank you 
Oh yeah, of course. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and I very much appreciate uh, the thanks for service to me. It never felt like that. I got to live out a dream. I, I thank my wife. She had the harder job. Um, and, and it, and it is hard. I wake up the same way a lot of times. And, and to be honest, just don't have a good feeling because you know, all of this is everywhere. And what I do, another thing that I do, and you, we may or may not have the time for that in the structure of our lives, but um, I go for a walk in the morning and I drink my coffee. I just walk. I live on this really cool road in Tennessee and um, I, I just walk down the road and I drink my coffee and I think and I pray and I reflect. I may listen to something, um, you know, that I like to listen to. And um, I try to get my mind right before I engage the day. So just getting bounced around all day, I try to, you know, get, my, get some clarity and get things right. And then and, and instead of letting everything attack me, attack the day, right? Well, Jason, I don't know if we have any other questions, but this was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say, you know, thank you for your service and thank you for sharing all of your insights. It was incredible. Um, it's too bad we can't give you a round of applause, but you can imagine it. <laughs> so thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Jason. And um, if you guys if you guys appreciated that and enjoyed it, if you could, this is how I make a living. I switched to remote training. StonewallSolutions.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all those things. And I don't have a huge following because I haven't pushed it, but I'm going to start because my existence is pretty much on the internet now. So thank you. Wait, all. I thought you said you stayed off the social media. What's that? <laughs> I said, I thought you said you stayed off the yeah, I, knew I, did, I did say that. So when I do, I try to post. I, I don't always do it well, but I try to post and then get in and, and, and get out. Um, it can be very valuable as well, but I try, to, I try to keep it business related and not get sucked into that. Good. You called me on that. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Mark, it would be good if we could share that information with the uh with the attendees so that you know the the article that you mentioned on your website um jason and, and some other bits of the resources that we know you have up there would be good for everyone to access as well good yeah, idea so i'm going to circle back with jason and the berman group to get uh, all of the information from the chat uh into an email consolidated and then also this uh this meeting was recorded so a lot of people have been asking me that so we're going to send that out uh from in a coronet email so keep an eye out for those coronet emails Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.